good to see you all here today. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Today is also Epiphany, which for many of our brothers and sisters in Christ, it was actually yesterday that they celebrated Christmas on January 6th. Today is Epiphany Sunday, which celebrates the visit of the wise men. So friends from other Christian traditions might be talking about that as well. But Happy New Year. It's going to be a good 2024. I have a feeling this is going to be a good 2023. It's going to be a good 2024. A few announcements here today. Uh, today, of course, uh, as we do every month on the first of the month, take a special offering for our work of our deacons. So if you'd like to contribute to the work of the deacons, there's a special envelope for that. Coming up on Saturday, we are going to gather together here in the sanctuary to remember and celebrate the incredible 103 years of life of Cy Battison. What an amazing and incredible man. I am excited to, to be together with his friends, with his family, with all of you, to celebrate his unbelievable and amazing life, his commitment to God's work in the world. A life well lived, 103 years. So 11 a.m. on Saturday, be here to celebrate Cy's life. Also coming up on January 13th, family game night. We're having family game night. If you are a family and you have a young friend in your family, a young one in your family, come on out for game night. Yes, I can feel that excitement right there. We're going to be playing some fun family games together. I'm looking forward to it. Five o'clock in Fellowship Hall. It's going to be a good time. I think we're doing pizza. Okay, I don't want to promise anything that we're not doing, but pizza and the best night of your whole entire life coming up on Saturday. Also, if you are a, a bit more mature and wise, you might want to join the Maritimers for Maritimers Night Out. Also, on January 13th at 5 p.m., the Maritimers are heading to the Olive Garden. I hear there's a contest amongst the Maritimers to see who can eat the most soup salad and breadstick from the endless soup salad and breadstick. I'm interested to see who the winner of that contest is going to be. But uh, also, yeah, so also on uh, Saturday night, Maritimers night out, 5 o'clock at the Olive Garden. Be there. Uh, one other brief announcement. You might already know this. The email accounts for all of the staff members of St. James Presbyterian Church, with the exception of Claire, have not been working all week. They have not been operational all week, and we have been working very diligently to try to get them to work again, uh, with many uh, starts and stops to that process. But this is also to say, if you sent an email to one of the staff members over the past week, there's a very, very high likelihood that it did not get to us. So if you've been waiting to hear back from one of us to an important email and we haven't gotten back to you, my apologies. It's because the email probably did not get to us. If you want to, uh, so feel free to call the church. Just give us a call. I can give you my personal email, too, if you want to get a hold of me. Until hopefully in the next day or two, we will be back to having a fully operational email system. So that's what's going on there. But we are here to give praise to God, to remember that our God is present, to remember that our God is here. So let's bring our hearts and minds together for worship. Here in this place, God welcomes all the dreamers as well as all the doubters. Here the worriers and wanderers can call on God by name. Here in this time, we can remember all the ways God has graced us. In these moments, we are reminded that God is with us always. I want to invite those who are able to please rise. Let's join together in worship with our opening song, Behold the Star.
Well, friends, one of these disciplines that we have that helps train us in righteousness, keep us on that path, is to confess our sins before God. It takes a lot of courage to turn to God and to turn over to God those places where we have fallen short. But this is one of the disciplines that we practice every single week. So I want to invite you now, in full confidence of God's forgiveness, to turn together now with our prayer of confession. Let's pray. We are stubborn people, O oh Lord. We have entered the season in which your light has been given to the world, and yet all we can think about is our own needs, our own desires. Help us to desire you, Lord. Help us to yearn for your presence. Let us again receive the blessings offered in creation, in the birth and baptism of Jesus, and in the ministry of our fellow followers of Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear this good news today. Christ has come into the world, first as a baby, born at Christmas time, grown into a man who took up his cross, shed his blood so that we may be forgiven of our sins, so we can courageously go to God and confess those sins. So know today that together as the people of Christ, we are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Well, folks, as we jump into our sermon today, I actually want to start with a story. We'll get into the scripture here in a second, but I want to tell you about when I was in first grade. When I was in first grade, my best friend, his name was Jock. And once we met early on in first grade, we quickly bonded over our, uh, let's say, studiousness and our desire to impress our teachers uh, we bonded because we were both, uh, you know, that kid in the class, right? And as first grade moved along, we grew closer and closer, and then Christmas break quickly approached. Now, as with most first graders, the year revolved around Christmas, where all of my deepest longings for toys came true. That year, I was hoping for some Fisher-Price walkie-talkies that looked just like telephones. Anybody remember the Fisher-Price? Yeah, all right. Okay, cool. Well, I asked my friend Josh, I said, Josh, what are you asking for for Christmas? And he said he didn't celebrate Christmas because his family was Jewish. Now, at this age, this made no sense whatsoever. Not because of any theological discrepancies, like that was nowhere in my mind, but rather, all of a sudden, this fear that Josh wasn't going to get any presents for Christmas. So I rushed home to my parents in this deep distress and panic, and I said, Josh isn't going to get any presents for Christmas. I said, what is this Jewish thing that keeps him from getting presents? Now, needless to say, this was my first contact with someone of a faith tradition other than Christianity. Or more specifically, a, faith, uh, a present dispersal tradition other than the one that I knew. Faith, that was in the back of my mind. Presence, I knew about that. Now, my fears were calmed down when I heard about the eight days of Hanukkah, and I was like, oh, cool. Josh is safe. He's going to get presents for eight days. All right, he's good. I don't need to, to worry anymore. But Josh and I continued to be friends throughout grade school, and our relationship was very important because it helped me gain a better understanding of my own uh, uh, tradition, the traditions of my own family, and the, the traditions of his family as well. Now, I bet maybe that we can all think back to a time where you first encountered someone of a different faith tradition, or maybe you grew up without any faith tradition, and the first time you encountered somebody 
of faith. There were quite a lot of questions and thoughts into your mind. And most likely, you encountered this through practices, traditions, maybe dietary rules, special holidays, family customs. And so when we're young, ideally, we develop this rudimentary understanding of different faith traditions. That one is maybe not the other. Or if you grew up Christian, you learned that Christians are, are not Jewish people, or Jewish people are not Christians, or something like that. It can get really confusing. And then it can become really confusing, maybe even surprising to hear, that Jesus, the center of the Christian faith, was a Jewish man, raised in a Jewish family, and he closely followed the Jewish traditions. And I believe it's especially important for us to reflect on this today. Jesus, the faithful Jewish man, because the nation of Israel, as we very well know, the home to many modern Jewish people, is at war with Hamas, a terrorist organization that claims to represent the Palestinian people, another group of people who have historically lived for centuries in that same parcel of land. That is the very place where Jesus walked and taught, and this all led to the formation of the Christian faith. This land where so many historic things have happened is at war. And religious and cultural allegiances are getting tied up into this in ways that we never could have expected around the world, in our country, in our, in our city, all these entanglements of national and cultural and religious identity. This war has had a massive impact on the world. So I think it's good, again, for us to reflect for a minute on what that means for us as Christians who follow a Jewish man who lived in what is today known as Israel and Palestine. Okay, so where do we start to make sense of all this? Well, first, what we call the Old Testament, it tells the story of the Jewish or Hebrew people going all the way back to the time of Abraham and their journey alongside God. Or we might say that it tells the story of God as God's plans are worked out through the Jewish people. And a big part of this was living by God's law, living as a holy people who are different, observing the rules, the customs, the traditions for justice and purity that God set out through Moses. You remember the movie, Charlton Heston, the two big tablets coming down from the mountain? The law, the Mosaic law that the Jewish people followed. This law that God said, I'm giving this to you to help you be a pure people, to be my people, to live justly and righteously with one another and with your neighbors. So then when we get to Jesus, the gospel writers make it very clear that Jesus was born into an obser observant Jewish family who followed the Mosaic Law, every bit of the Mosaic Law. Luke records that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day as the law dictated. And as Jesus grows up, he remains an observant Jewish man. And that never changes. But once his ministry starts, this is where it gets a little tricky, he is openly critical of many of the interpretations of that Mosaic Law, the interpretations that were being taught by the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time. And this is what Jesus says here about the law. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Jesus said, Do not think that I, Jesus, have come to abolish the law or the prophets, all of this history and tradition of Judaism that has come before me. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter 
the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus did not come to abolish the Mosaic law or the prophets and what they taught, but to fulfill it. To bring purpose, the purpose of the law, into culmination. Which meant being critical, Jesus was openly critical and got a lot of grief for it from the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, because he was critical of the unjust and often exclusionary ways that the Pharisees were interpreting and living out the law. As the Pharisees taught the law, it marginalized many people, left people out, excluded people. It wasn't just. And so much of Jesus' ministry, then, as we see, was bringing people back into the fold, bringing people back into the family. A large part of his doing healings was to bring people back in. Reaching out to women, bringing women back into the fold, bringing, uh, in, encompassing and showing this love of God to bring people back into this family. These people that had been excluded and pushed to the side by the Pharisees' interpretation of the law. This also shows that Jesus didn't come to create a new religion. He didn't come to end one religion and start another, not in the slightest. Really, it was history that we might say that did that. Now, of course, Jesus, those 12 disciples, those 12 guys that followed him around, they were all Jewish as well. But as we've talked about before, they lived in this multicultural and pluralistic society. And there were a lot of Greek people around, the Romans too. They were hanging around too. And after Jesus' death and resurrection, followers were in, uh, they were in an odd place. The Jewish establishment, the establishment of Judaism, was often hostile to this new movement of Christ followers. And many people who were not Jewish wanted to be Christ followers. They wanted to join in this incredible movement that was happening. And then comes in Paul. And Paul says, I'm going to make it my whole mission to go out and reach the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles, and teach them about Jesus. That is, this fulfillment, this culmination of what God started with Abraham and being fulfilled in all of the world. It was decided by the church in the book of Acts that you didn't, ultimately they decided you didn't need to become Jewish first to become a Christian. It came down to that thing, circumcision again. And there were a lot of people who wanted to be Christians but didn't want to go through the whole circumcision thing in order to become a Christian. And there was a decision made by the church that said, no, you can just become a Christian as following Christ. And this door opened the door widely for the church to grow amongst the Gentiles, and it took off. And I would say probably all of us here are Gentiles, and we're sitting here today because that door was open to us. In 70 AD, a few decades after Jesus, the unthinkable happened. A group of Jewish people called the Zealots revolted against the Romans, took up arms against the Romans, and the Romans said, no deal, fought back, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and the Jewish people became dispersed out into the world, what today we call the diaspora. And Jerusalem could no longer serve as the center of Judaism. The faith shifted into the synagogue system, which we still have today, with local places of worship all around the world. And as the Christian faith, made up mostly at this point of Gentiles, developed its own customs and traditions. And so did Judaism in the diaspora. And in effect, Judaism went one direction and Christianity went another. And so this one faith in the one God became two distinct faiths, distinguished by different traditions and customs and disciplines. Now, there's a big question that often comes up here that is always important to address. Have Christians then replaced Jewish people as God's chosen people? And the answer is an unequivocal no. You see, that's a position that's called supersessionism. It's a position that has led to many issues throughout history, including the Holocaust, it's a belief that still exists out there. It is definitely not biblical. 
Rather, we, the Gentile Christians, have been brought into, welcomed into, enveloped into God's big plan that has been worked out through history through the Jewish people. And God is saying, I'm bringing all of you guys into this too, as this is worked out through Jesus. Paul makes this very clear in the book of Romans. It's an image of an olive tree. He says the Gentiles have been grafted on to the olive tree, the olive tree of God's people. So we have been grafted on, not a new tree, but being grafted on to the already existing tree. All this is to say is that Jewish people are our kinsmen. They are part of the wider faith, the family of God's people, the family of people that God is utilizing to do God's work in the world. And we should love and support our Jewish brothers and sisters. And, like Jesus, we need to be actively looking for those who are marginalized, for those who have been hurt by religion, for those who have been excluded, for those who have been suffering injustice, whoever and wherever they might be. Because thousands of years ago, God chose a man named Abraham through, he, who, through whom he could start working out this plan of reconciliation with the whole world. And that plan included Jacob and Moses and David and Mary and, of course, Jesus and Peter and Paul and you and me and all of us. And that we, that this man, Jew, this Jewish man named Jesus, through his grace, we have been grafted on into this incredible family to do God's work. Grafted onto the root, that master plan that God has for redeeming and renewing the world. And has called us to look for all those places where there is injustice, where there are people who are suffering needlessly, where there are people who are hurting, people who need the love of God. What a joy it is, brothers and sisters in Christ, followers of God, members of this family. What a joy it is to be a part of God's plan to be reconciled with God. Let's go to God with a word of prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for the ways that your plan has been worked out in the world. All the way back to creation, to Abraham, through all of the faithful Jewish people, including Jesus and all the way to us today. Help us to continue on in that faith to do your work and to preach your good news of justice and reconciliation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
microphone back on. There we go. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to invite you to come and join at this table. Join with our family of Christ, both here in this church today and around the world and throughout all of history. All those Christians who have come and shared together in this blessing of the body and blood of Christ. We are united with all of those people. All of those people throughout history. What an exciting and incredible thing to think about. I want to invite anyone who wants to know God more to come and share in this sacrament here at this table. It helps us to remember what Christ has done, what God has done through the person of Jesus, and how we are all called and welcomed back, even as we are sinners called and welcomed back into this amazing family. As we gather around this table, it is good for us to speak out loud together what it is we believe. We have today, it's up on the screen, it's not in the bulletin today, but it's up on the screen. This is a passage from the brief statement of faith, a Presbyterian statement of faith. It can help us really focus and understand who Christ is. So I want to invite you to join with me as we say our statement of faith together. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the broken heart, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the God. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified suffering the depths of human pain, and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. Let's go to God with a word of prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for this time and this opportunity to gather around this table take this bit of bread and to drink this bit of wine and to remember that you are present here, that you are present in ways beyond our understanding here in this sacrament and further out into our lives, that you were renewing and sustaining our faith through this sacrament, this sacrament that we celebrate today with all the saints, present and past. Gracious God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Amen. Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Every time you eat it, you do so in remembrance of me. So we take our communion bread today, take our wafer. As we eat together, we remember that this is the body of Christ, broken for you. The same way he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins, Every time you drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. So we take our cups today. We remember Christ. We remember that this is Christ's blood shed for you. We remember today that every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord Until he comes again. Amen. 
Our closing song today is Rise Up, Shepherd, and Follow. If you were able to rise up, please do so, and us loudly, joyfully sing our praises to God. shepherds let's do that indeed rise up let's follow the star that leads to christ and follow christ our savior and in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit go in peace and be blessed amen